What's up, book friends? Today we're back in the universe of Cradle. We're talking about book four, Sky Sworn by Will White. I'm gonna give my brief spoiler-free thoughts and then we'll dive into just spoiler-filled talk about this book because I've kind of been struggling with how I wanted to do these books that are deeper into a series and I've been sticking to trying to keep them spoiler-free, but I realized that if you're already four books into a series, you're, you're gonna read them anyway. So I just wanna kinda keep these more as sharing my thoughts, giving a bit of analysis of the writing here and the storytelling and just like talking about the book I think that's gonna be a fun thing so obviously here's your spoiler warning I'm gonna do a little bit of spoiler free stuff and then spoilers for all four books if you haven't read any of these books I've got I've got channel videos I've got videos of these books I got videos of these books right here so you can so you can you can check check those out come back here or go read the books or something and we could talk we could have a nice little one-on-one -on -one. Hi, how are you? How you doing? And with that out of the way, let's start talking about Sky Sworn. This book picks up right where we left off. Linden is under arrest by the Empire Police known as the Sky Sworn. He's still building up to that fight with Jai Long. And that plot's gonna take us a good chunk into this book. And then the rest of the book uh, is going to be the aftermath of that. And I imagine that a lot of these events are going to echo into later books. So this book is pretty critical for moving forward in this story, I feel. I've heard from a lot of people that this is their least favorite book of the series. And that's really a shame because I think this book is really strong. I had a really good time with just the general story that we were following. I think it focuses a lot on the lesser shine characters that haven't gotten a lot of growth and have just kind of been there as expository machines. We get to see a bit more of them and more visceral emotions from them. We see that in Ithan. We see that in Fisher Geisha. We see that in a lot of characters here that I didn't expect to. And honestly, those are some of my favorite scenes. Book four kind of puts a pause on Linden's training as the main focus and kind of pulls out and looks at the greater world. We're looking at some political issues. We're looking at some more world building issues. And a lot of that is kind of the focus. Linden's not getting a lot of progression here. Physically, I mean, you're not going to see him jump a rank or two in this book. I do think you get some good character growth for him and some good realizations and some kind of hints at where he's going to be moving forward from here. Like I said, I really enjoyed this book. I think we got some great action scenes in here. I feel like the action scenes here were a big step up in stakes as well as just kind of a step up for entertainment for the most part from the reader. I think that Will White's writing here really shows a lot of growth and I think it's a really good kickoff to the next trilogy of Cradle Books 4, 5, 6 which is what? Sky Sworn, Ghost Pool, Undermountain, Underbog, Underminer. I don't know. You can look them up if you want. That's not my job. I'm not. With my spoiler free little ditty at the beginning of this video is out of the way, I want to start talking about specifics about this book. I think this book has an amazing thematic focus on loss. It really echoes through a lot of the storylines that we're following here, particularly Linden's and Jai Dai Shows. You're not really going to be finding Linden winning any fights in this book or really getting anything to go his way. And I really like that, actually. I think that if we didn't have this break where Linden's just, he's got to lose at some point. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty boring to see him constantly win, win, win. And now, oh, he's at the top. He didn't really have any struggles. Seeing these losses and spending almost a whole book exclusively on the Linden's losses was, I think, critical for the pacing of this story. And it gives a lot of real stakes to like what's going on here. I mean, he's made to feel incredibly weak over and over again throughout this story from, from Jai Long, from the Sky Sworn to the Dread God. He's not the first low gold to finish that competition to become a Sky Sworn, even though he had his true gold companion literally carry him through the whole competition. I think Jai Daisho is also mirroring this from the other side where he has a lot of power and is scared of losing it, where Linden's lack of power is what's causing his loss. We're following Jai Daisho being so scared of losing his legacy, his power, his life. He's willing to go to the ends of the earth to accidentally wake up a dread god just to make sure that he doesn't lose these things. And I think that the Jai Long fight plot point feeding right into the Blood Phoenix might feel a little jarring for a lot of people. This is kind of a weird thing because if you think about it structurally, it does feel a bit weird, right? You have you have the end of book three kind of push into book four. For a good third of it, it's that Jai Long fight. And then there's a little chunk in the middle where they go to be cops and then the Blood God is, is there. There's this 
impending doom that carries through all three of these plot points where you have the way that the police make Lyndon and Yaren feel like prisoners and how they're not really trusted and they're still kind of under the boot of this organization and they're not able to be free here. Then the literal oppressive force of the Dread God marching through the entire continent. I think with this book ending with a Dread God waking up, that dread, that, that, <laughs> that impending doom really feeds into that emotion and that event really well. But also I feel like it was really intentional that Will White wanted to show this one fight between two golds and the, the political impact that this has echoes to way bigger problems. I think this chain of events that Will White opens this book with is trying to get this point across of, look what the fear of Ithan Aurelius put into the Jai Underlord and pushed him to do. The Dread God isn't here because someone was stupid and made a dumb mistake or a, a dumb vying for power. Well, it, it was kind of dumb because Jai Dai Cho is kind of a big idiot. But more importantly, it was what happens when people are scared of losing what power they have. Look what taking shortcuts to maintaining that power or getting power. Look what those shortcuts get you. Linden with no arm, Jai Dai Cho with no life. Like, taking shortcuts in the Cradle Universe is bad. And that's kind of Linden's whole thing right now, is he's constantly looking for workarounds, for shortcuts, and he hasn't been punished a lot yet. But Jai Dai Show is a perfect forecast of where that'll get you when you're just looking for shortcuts to solve all your problems. I re like I said in the spoiler free, I really liked a lot of the character moments that we got in this book. Not only that moment where Jai Dai Show realizes just how much better Ithan is than him, that was such a great scene. It shows this like despair when he opens the cage and there's just a note. That was cool, not only because I hate him, but because it gives us a lot of of insight into like his psyche in that moment. It also builds up Ithan's character as way better than other Underlords, despite what you might believe about Ithan off the bat. Ithan also shows us a bit more uh, behind the mask that he's constantly wearing as the character of Ithan Aurelius, the great Underlord Patriarch. And I really enjoyed that. It's showing that he's not so one-dimensional and gives us a bit more of like a human touch to him. I really like that moment when Fisher Geisha just kind of rips into Ithan for letting Linden get to where he is, both how hard he's pushing him with training, the loss of this arm, that follow-up clash that Linden has with Ithan, where Linden's furious. Ithan let him lose his arm, not because it needed to happen for some greater plan, but because Ithan was a bit too focused on something else. Even Orthos is, is growing as a character in my mind. The last book, he was kind of just like this expository machine, and while he's still is that he's getting some character he's getting so i really like that he's scared of sky clouds i think that's hilarious i like this old teacher that orthos fills where he doesn't care about anything it seems like every one of these books we kind of zoom out and scope where we have new relative strength and a new scope of what is super powerful and what is super weak so like first you have the sacred valley and like jade is crazy and then we zoom out and it's the three families of the wastes golds are kind of spooky here and then you kind of zoom out again and you have the whole black flame empire and now underlords of the big cheese uh, once more you zoom out and you have the akura empire where the black flame empire is just a vassal state of the akura empire we see a monarch and we get a lot more building of the gaps of space between what an underlord is and a monarch and then also just true golds and underlords become way more prevalent in the interactions that are taking place on screen instead of just being mentioned as they exist as these mystical beings we're kind of shifting this like window of scope up and up and up and i think that's done really well i think that pacing is really cool how we move past something but something is there to fill the gap and it doesn't feel like it's just being made up off the top of your head to come up with the new weakness for linden it feels planned out and it just kind of works as oh well yeah no it feels good that linden's this strong but he's still not like anything compared to an underlord right now he's he can barely handle a true gold i do feel like after the giant Long arm chop bonanza, we lose out on a lot of depth of our core antagonists. Jai Long goes off and does something. I assume we'll see him later. Jai Dai Show dies, and those were our two antagonists, and they had a lot of depth to them. All of the antagonists that we're introduced to are very flat characters. We have all the members of the Sky Sworn, and they just kind of seem bigoted, stuck in their ways against Yaren and Linden. And then, of course, well, you got the, the big angry bird blood god thing, and, and all of their mind-controlled blood moon hall sacred artists well if you're mind controlled or you're a big god you're not going to get a lot of emotional growth in a book 
are you? Maybe we'll see more of the Blood Moon Hall later when when the Phoenix isn't awake and they have a bit more explanation as to why they are the sacred artists that they are. For now, it's just kind of this faceless enemy that's totally fine for anyone to kill. And I think that they handled the Monarch Dread God fight actually really well. We didn't see a lot going on there. Then that's a stylistic choice by Will White, and I think it's the correct choice here. I mean, you have this fight of scale that readers can't comprehend in the story yet. You've got this dread beast whose wings stretch the horizon, this mystical monarch who, when you utter their name anywhere on the planet, they'll know you're there. For all of those great aspects of that idea, you only really get, there was a tussle for three days and then it all got dispersed. The way that that story gets told to us feels way more like a legend, feels like a mythical tale, because that's really what's fighting up there, legends and mythical tales. And so I think kind of scaling down the the concrete that we got for this fight and making it from the perspective of Linden, we saw about as much as we were going to see. There's no way through the eyes of Linden that we'd ever be able to comprehend how that fight went. And I think that that's really good setup for when Linden inevitably becomes a monarch. It's a cultivation series. I'm not stupid. It's not like he's going to get the Underlord and then be like, oh, I'm done now. As soon as he gets to monarch, we're actually going to have that fight again, or it's, you know, something similar. And we're going to have the context. We're going to be able to get the scale and the scope of this fight in a way that we can't right now. And I think that that's really cool from a reader's perspective. You get this cultivation growth as well. It feels like you're putting the work in because things that can only be glanced over now, we're going to get in droves later. And so, you know, maybe we'll get the great three-day fight with the, the giant sky dragon i don't remember they they, they described the four other guy i don't know ultimately i really love this book i think it was a great addition to the cradle series i'll give it like 13 of the 13 serete squads or something if we're gonna keep doing re review numbers if you liked anything that i had to say here if you want to see more of this content why don't you, why don't you go on down there and, and hit that like button if you haven't yet hit that subscribe button thank you so much for checking out this video i really appreciate it i'll catch you in the next one and until then, stay lit.